that's hard to do whenever you're just saying all those praises to the Father. And you just feel his love just pouring through you. And you just want him to be here face to face so you can hug him really tight. Don't, don't you sometimes feel like that? And you're not ashamed to hug him because you know that you know that you know that you're doing the best that you can to do everything he's calling you forth to do. And you know you don't have to back up to him that he's a father who cares. And he's just there with open arms saying, come on home. Amen. So when you mess up like I do, just say, Daddy, I need to come into your open arms. And I need you to let me know that all is well. Amen. And that's what he does. He pats you on the back and he tells you straighten up and go on. And then each each day holds new challenges. And every day the devil's there to tempt you. See, he tempts me in the way and he tells me that God's finished with me. So see, I go through that. I don't know what you go through, but each one of you go through your own challenges every day. And I have to tell him just to get lost. After I cry a little bit and pray a little bit and talk a little bit, then I tell the devil to get lost. God, God reassures me that all is well. And see, if you, I was sitting there tonight and I was thinking about that song, Talking to Jesus. We're going to play that again Wednesday night because I think you all forgot how to talk to Jesus. Because everybody's discouraged and downhearted and downtrodden. And we talk to each other, but we aren't talking to Jesus. Now, see, if the shoe fits, put it on. If it doesn't, then just say, well, God, whoever doesn't talk to you, just show them how to talk to you. Amen? That's whenever you you know whether you're a grown-up child of God or whether you're still a baby. Well, there they go, talking about me again. Hey, come on. God is real. And God is secure. And if we run into his open arms, we become real and we become secure. It doesn't matter what the world has to say. And you, you're, you're, you are flesh and blood, right? And there's going to be days where you're going to act flesh and blood because enough is enough. Just like Jesus did when he walked the earth, right? When enough was enough that he threw a fit. Read your word. He did do that. And so we think, well, we can't throw no fit because, after all, we're children of God. But, you know, there's a limit where the enemy can push you, and then you have to do your worldly thing, let your flesh act out a little bit, <laughs> right? And then after you get all that out, uh, out of your, off of your chest, then you finally say, okay, God, let's start all over again here today, and, and let's go forward. So it's forward momentum. No more stagnation, no more going backwards, but forward. I don't care where you came from. I don't care what you're doing. It's forward. And I don't care how many times the enemy's pulled you down into his pit. You're not there now. So you got back up again. The word of God says a righteous man will fall seven times in one day and seven times he'll get back up again. That's no excuse to sin now, guys. <laughs> I'm just saying God knows, he knows your framework. He made you. And he knows some days you'll go past seven and mess up. And, but he's always there to take your hand and pull you back up again. You know, God called us into a deepness of him this morning that he hasn't called us to. And I know that God did a prayerful work here this morning. Now the enemy is not happy about that. He's not the least bit happy about that. And if you think he's going to walk away and say, oh, well, Oh, they drowned this morning. I guess I'm lost. I'm undone with them. No, he's not. He's going to, every day now, he's going to bombard you with something or other to try to make you believe that you weren't, you were the one that was still standing on the riverbank and didn't get drowned. You all got drowned, all right? You, I can guarantee you all got drowned. And so now we just have to move on. This morning, we're going to talk about carrying the genuine heart of Timothy. And to tell you the truth, this is something I read with somebody else's last week, and I added my part to it. But it, this is so true, and there's not enough Timothys in the house of God. There just is not. We are not rooted and grounded in Christ like Timothy was, where God can ask us to do absolutely anything, and we will do it. We won't go into it with, with the... With a thought of failure, we go into it with a thought of total victory because God called us to do the thing. 
Well, Father, I just thank you for these people who came out tonight because they're hungry and thirsty, and they want to sit at your table. They want to, they want to be fed fresh, fresh manna from heaven. And I'm asking right now, Father God, these are faithful people. I'm asking that you drop yourself down upon them right now tonight. Open up their spiritual eyes so they see into the spirit realm tonight. And let them know that they know that they know, Father God, that you have taken them into a new depth in you and that the enemy cannot pull them away from you. Give them encouragement tonight, Father. Open up their spiritual eyes and let them see as you see. Open up their spiritual ears and let them hear your voice, Father. And Father, I truly do thank you for all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I want each one of you in here, because as I look around, each one of you are people who have been coming for years. I want you to walk in the same anointing that God's had me walk in, where you can actually walk so far, so close to God in the spirit realm that you'd be sitting in your room and you can hear conversations in the rest of the house. You hear what people are saying. Somebody can walk in front of you and, you know, they're, they're, they have a facade about them, a pretense, but God will let you know exactly what they're really all about. And, you know, whenever you talk to people, God will show you exactly what's going on in their life. Now, that's not so you can throw it at them, but he'll let you see who they are, really. And then he'll talk to them, trying to pull them up. It's a wonderful place to be. It's a wonderful place to walk in. The enemy can never pull anything over on you because you're walking so close. The Spirit of God is constantly telling you what's going on. All right? I mean, with what God spoke to Brother Brett this morning, I'm glad he's wearing those shoes and not me. <laughs> Sorry, Brother Brett. We'll just hold him up in prayer. But see, when God didn't want him to walk in that into that blind, God wanted him to know he was headed in that direction. And now Brother Brett can get himself built up in his most holy faith. And so whenever it comes, he says, here it is. And then he can fight that battle. All right? It, with, a, with a stance of victory and not failure. All right, this is what God spoke to me. God spoke to me and said, so much brokenness in the world, and my people who think they know me are more broken than the world. That is a true statement. Of course, God said it, but it, whether he said it or not, it is a true statement. We can see that in the house of God. All right, so December 21st was the first day of winter. And what does our Father always admonish us about the winter months? Remember, I taught about this years ago. He always kept telling, well, he kept telling me, first of all, don't, daughter, don't die in your winter months. Well, I had no clue what that meant. And so as God led me through it, I found out what that meant. Now, your winter months are times when you're in dire straits, when things are going wrong in your life. And you just feel like there's just, you can't, you will never see daylight ever again. That's what your winter months are. And when God says, don't, die, when he told me, don't die in your winter months, he was saying, walk through this thing. Don't let the enemy take you out. Don't die in this situation. And how many of us think, I'm just never going to make it. That's dying in your winter, in your, in your storms that come your way. You don't ever say that again. Things are going to come. And you're going to feel like you can't make it. But I guarantee you, you will make it. If you hold on to the hands of the master, you will make it. God's already starting to, to uh, speak to me and tell some of you different things that God wants you to do. There are things you have never done before. And so you're, you're going to walk, step out there in faith and do what God's telling you to do. And it's not you doing it, it's God doing it. And then you just let him go and take over and do it. Each one of you in here are called to be a leader. That's why you're here. And God's been... God's been admonishing you, and God's been building you up in your most holy faith, and, and God's been in, trying to be in total control of your lives for years now. And now is a time when he said, it's make it or break it time. A lot of times he says to me, this is where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> you know, either you made it the grade or you didn't. But, you know, as I look around, each one of you in here tonight, you've made the grade. You still might be struggling in some areas of your life, but you've made the grade. And God is going to use you exactly the way he said he's going to use you. And you, you should rejoice in your tribulations, like Paul says, because you know that God is 
going to do great and wonderful things with you, or the devil would leave you totally and completely alone. Now, how many of you can say that before you became born again, your life was just simple? You know, just day-to-day -day life, you know, and, and nothing ever bothered you or the devil never bothered you. And then all of a, come, all of a sudden you became born again. Then all hell broke loose. And you was no longer comfortable in your sin. And all kind of different things were happening. You didn't know what was going on. The minute you became born again, you, at that point you became a threat to the Father. Now, I've always gone to church all my life. My grandmother started me in church when I was two months old. But nobody ever told me that I could hear God's voice. Nobody ever told me I could speak to God. Nobody ever told me that God performed miracles. And I never read my word. I let the pastor read my word to me when I went to church. But in the late 70s when I became born again, the first thing God did was take me out of my body and let me look down at my body and kneeling at the bed, and it took me on a journey. That was the first experience I had as soon as I was born again. And from that point on, it was just new revelation after new revelation after new revelation. See, and then my whole life turned around. I mean, all hell broke loose in my life. Nothing was going right. Why? The Satan didn't touch me for 50 years, but all of a sudden I became born again. Satan came because he knew what I was going to do if he didn't get me out of God's hands. So, you know, just because you're going through all hell because you became born again does not mean you've lost anything. It means you've gained, and you have the victory, and the enemy's upset. He's afraid of you. Many times when I've been doing deliverance, we used to do deliverances, the devil would say, I know who you are, and we can't touch you, but I can touch what a member of your family. You know, see, he's af he was afraid of me. He's still afraid of me. He's afraid of you guys. But you have to understand that and quit being afraid of him. And I've even told you before that I used to always, when he would come and threaten me, you know, the devil would come and threaten me, he was going to do this, that, and the other. I was real smart allegory like, I said, oh, no, you just can't touch me. Well, he touched me. He turned me every which way but loose. But see, like Job God was with Job, but God was with me. And he told the devil, you can do anything to her except kill her. And whenever and God explained that to me, too, before it happened, he said, this is what the devil's going to do to you. He won't be able to kill you, though. And I held on to that. You need to hold on to that, too, because you're a child of God. And you're going through your Job experiences. The devil can do anything he wants to to you, but he can't kill you. And sometimes you're like Job. You wish you would. <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest. So let's just hold our head up a little bit higher tonight and let us march forward and let people see what, it, what God is really like, that no matter how many furnace experiences you have, God is with you in the furnace. All right? As I was reading through the book of Philippians, I was stopped by a verse where Paul is greatly hoping to send his dear and trusted friend Timothy to, to the believers in Philippi. And this is what Paul says about Timothy. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19 through 21. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I too may be cheered by news for, of you. For I have no one like him, I have no one like him, who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. He could trust Timothy. And God's been wanting to, wanting to tell, talking to us about trust. God has to know he can trust you before he'll send you. He has to know that you're not going to die in your winter months. He's, he has to know that no matter what storm comes your way, you're going to stand your ground. One time I was going through a terrible ordeal, and God said, get into the eye of the storm. Then I found out when you get into the eye of the storm, there's calm there and there's peace there, and you can't be hurt. And I never knew that before. And what he was saying is, climb into my arms and stay there, and I'll keep you safe until the storm passes by. And instead of us climbing into the arms of Jesus, who can keep us safe, we get on our cell phone. We call a friend. We call the pastor. We call on everybody except Jesus. 
That's why I love that song, because people really need to learn to talk to Jesus. Are you listening here? And you, I don't know if you're going through this or not, but I just came through this where um, I might be still in it, where God has drawn me totally to myself, no communication with anybody. So all I can do is talk to Jesus. Do you know God longs to hear your voice? He really does, he listens every day for your voice so you can talk to him. Remember when I told you I didn't I thought I sinned years and years and years ago and I didn't talk to Jesus for three days and then I got up one morning because I loved it. I love God's nature. I think it's beautiful. And I opened up the curtains to the bay window and I said, Oh Father. I was gonna say how beautiful the trees look today. And he he started laughing. His daughter, I've waited three whole days to talk to you. I want to tell you something. He was excited. I can't remember what he what he told me, but I just felt on my knees crying that my father in heaven was waiting three whole days for a little common Barbara, a nobody, to talk to him. Are you listening to this? Let's start talking to Jesus. Instead of call, picking up the phone and calling everybody or getting on your little email, why don't we talk to Jesus? Send him an email message. And if you do that, you won't die in your winter months. You'll be frostbitten and everything else, but you won't die. <laughs> Say, how much longer is this winter going to last? All right. All right, the genuine heart of Timothy. Paul makes it clear that there are, are few or even none like Timothy. Timothy walked and lived with a genuine heart of concern for the welfare of others. He was not merely seeking his own interest. It is so sad that it is rare to find such a man or a woman. For years, I would keep seeing this eye in the spirit realm, and I said, God, what is that? He said, that's me. I'm searching to and fro for men who will truly surrender themselves to me and follow me. And he has still, he's still doing that today. And he said, I cannot find one worthy to do the things that I'm calling them forth to do. And you women are the same. God needs to know he can trust you. He, he needs to know you're not going to be a gossiper and a backbiter. He needs to know that you're a lover of your family and you're your husband and your children and the lover of the people in the house of God and even love your enemies. That's what he's looking for. This is who Timothy was. If you really think about it, Paul, when he was writing this about Timothy, he was sitting in a prison in stocks and he'd been beaten. And he had salt on his back, and he wasn't sitting there complaining. He was writing a letter about somebody else in the house of God, a good letter. Okay, well, it, it is so sad that there is, it is rare to find such a man as Timothy. On occasion, I have the absolute joy and privilege of meeting these rare men and women. They love, they serve, and they live with the heart of Jesus for his people and with such genuine integrity. Church, we need to be like, more like Timothy. And we need to quit thinking about ourselves. And we need to start thinking about the people around about us that God has placed us in their midst so we can show the love of Christ to them. These individuals always just cause me to stop and watch and learn. I stop. This, this is what the other person wrote. But I stop and I watch and I learn that the church is a mess. <laughs> That's what I see. I don't see Timothy's in the church. Uh, yeah, we're being honest, right? The truth will set you free. And we're being honest. There's not enough Timothy's in the house of God. You know, you sit under a strong anointing and you get out and get in your car and you, you're a pistol all the way home. Long, grumpy face. You have an attitude. And you just sit in the very presence of the Most High God. I know that happens to more than one family. All right. They give without the thought of why am I always giving or counting the cost. Well, I do for others, but nobody cares about me. I hate to hear that. <laughs> well, you're not doing it in the right attitude if you're always concerned about, well, nobody's doing this for me. 
That's not a Timothy spirit. That's a self-righteous spirit that wants to be, you know, wants somebody to tell them how wonderful they are all the time. So Jesus didn't say that when he was out there ministering. He didn't say, you know, exalt me, do something for me. If you ever got in that attitude, he went to the mountain. I bet he had a path born to the mountain, don't you? Because, you know, he had to deal with the people just like we have to deal with the people. All right, these people love without limits and without a demand to be seen. They serve with both joy and true concern for another. They are genuine. And where are the Timothys? I want you to think about this. Church culture has far too often highlighted gifts over true character. Oh, use me, Lord, use me, use me. Not to save souls, but use me as signs and wonders and miracles so I'll be seen. and My name will be up in lights. That's what really goes on in the house of God. Excuse me. All right, this results in a performance-driven culture that drains both the leaders and the people. I find myself wondering, where are those who are like Timothy? Where are those with proven character? And what has God been saying? I'm trying, with everything I put you through, I'm trying to build character in you. So, well, I have character. No, no, there's something wrong with your character or God wouldn't be doing the things he's doing with you. And we need to, we need to truly submit to God. Say, God, whatever this flaw is, get it out of me. Because I'm tired of going through the storms of life just so you can build character in me. <clears throat> Excuse me. Where are those with, pro with proven character and genuine concern for the people's welfare? Where are the leaders who take far greater joy in seeing their people truly becoming like Jesus and developing his character inside of them? Now, see, I made that statement, but I, I have a problem because I see you developing character. Next thing I know, I see you back in the slum again. I think, what is your problem? <laughs> I might just throw you in the river and drown you myself. So the whole, you say you're driven by the Holy Spirit, not by your flesh, right? If we had many Timothys throughout our congregation, we'd probably have healthy families and churches that were truly lighthouses in the world's storms. This is not to bring condemnation on anyone because I have met those who I would consider true Timothys, but very few. Yet in the current global atmosphere, we need those with with the character of Timothy more than ever before. You know, if you're you know if you're married, you're living in your house together. You know, you don't say, "Well, I'm not going to do anymore because they're not doing their thing." And that is what happens. Well, they're not doing it, so I'm not going to do it. They're sitting watching TV, so I'm going to sit and watch. And that's stupid. That is not a Timothy spirit. If you're a true child of God, you're going to hear this and you're going to change. You're not there to see if, if somebody else is doing the same thing you're doing. You're there as a servant to the Most High God, and you're doing the things God you know that you're supposed to be doing, and God will take care of the one that's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Well, my husband, he just sits around with his feet propped up, drinking beer and watching TV. Well, then pray that the Holy Spirit can fix him. He makes me work, make me work like a slave. And I see that all the time. Men are not pulling their weight in the house of God, in, the, in their family. They're not doing the things. And if they do do anything, then they want you to pat them on the back 24-7. But then you have women <laughs> who do the very same thing. So this is not a one-sided thing. Men do it and women do it. All right? We need men and women who will walk in genuine love and concern for the well-being of people they are called to serve. Do you all know you're called to be a servant? Then why are you fussing all the time? I, I talk, I'm talking to myself, too, because I fuss, too. And don't say you don't, because you do, too. <laughs> Come on. And each of us need to ask the Holy Spirit to do that work within us, cause us to be a true servant. Paul fully trusted Timothy to be sent because of his integrity. And we want the Father to trust us with the people that he sends us to. When we stand before him, I fully believe that that, that will be one of the things that remains. How well and how genuinely did we love and care for others? 
Why do you care for others? Do you care for others just because you want something they have? Or do you care for them because you want to be patted on the back? Ask yourself, why do I really do what I do? Do you do it because it's a labor of love or just a labor? Come on, let's think about this tonight. You know, whenever okay, whenever I asked uh, Aaron to minister to somebody, I trust him. In the spirit realm, I trust him because I know what God says he can do. And I know that he'll only move as the spirit moves within him. Now, it, it, you know, I could do that to Brad. I, with Nancy or, or all you prophets, I do it because I can trust you because I know what God says he's fulfilling within your lives. And I know you've learned along the way not to walk in the flesh and do fleshy things. And I know that God has been, build, been building character and integrity in you. If you don't have character and integrity, people will walk away from you. My earthly father taught me that as a little girl with a with a belt. <laughs> he 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 whipped integrity and character within me. <laughs> I'm glad he did. Because God gets his whip out too. Come on. If you're gonna really be a person of stature, then you're gonna have to be chastised. God just can't let you wander around doing your, your thing. He's trying to make you just like your son, Jesus. Did you learn to love? If you were to die this moment, you would not be able to say yes. You could, some of you couldn't. Let's be honest. You just be honest with yourself. How many of you just got mad at somebody over the weekend? You weren't truly walking in love. If you threw a fit about it. I said, put that, did you learn to love? Because that's what, what was his name? That's what God told him. He's going to ask everybody when they die. First thing, Norval Hayes. Who? Oh, Bob Jones, yeah. He's, that's the first question he's going to ask you when you stand before him. Did you learn to love? Some of you don't love in the right attitude. You have a, you have a frozen smile on your face and you walk around. <laughs> I'm a servant. Yeah, I see. <laughs> You're a servant with an attitude. Come on. It is time to daily ask for a heart like Timothy's, which was like Jesus's, not just for pastors or for the, that rare individual that is loving well behind the scenes, but for every man and woman with every gift and in every position to walk in genuine concern for the well-being of the people they are called to serve. I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes when God shows me what you're up to, I just like taking bop you a good one. I thought, how could you do that? After all God has done for you, how could you do that? You know? And sometimes I like to bop my own self. So how can I do that? This is not a one-way street. You know, Leaders are not exempt. In fact, they, if they don't watch yourself, they're in deeper than the people are of doing stuff they shouldn't be doing. So, you know, when, when I teach you, God's already taught me. God's already taken me through the mill more times than I care to go. You know, like you said, you can go around that mountain as many times as you want to. But when you're ready to quit going around the mountain, I'm standing right here to help you. And he's saying the very same thing to each one of you. When, you're, when you are ready to quit trying to do things in your own strength, God's there to take over. Now, what if the leaders of nations had the integrity of Timothy and put the well-being of their citizens before anything else? Don't you wish that that person in the Oval Office would do that? The people would thrive and the nation would prosper. What's happening to the nation? The people are not striving and the, nation, and the nation's not prospering at all. What if the business leaders served like Timothy and raised up other leaders with a genuine concern for their employees and their well-being? From what I hear from some of you people, the, your employ, employers are not very nice people anymore. When I was working, my employers were always really nice, and they were concerned about what was going on in our life and were we happy. Now that's not the way it goes. The world is all twisted and messed up. All right, those companies and corporations would also thrive and prosper because their employees would thrive at work and at home. 
How many of you know that whenever you're at work daily and you have a bad boss, you know, you're all frazzled by the time you get off of work and you carry that right home. You, can't, you carry your frazzled attitude right into your house and then poor anybody that's living with you, sorry for them for the night <laughs> because you're going to take out your mess on them. Don't we see that? Don't you, you hear that a lot with men. They'll, they'll really be mean to their children and their wives because they've had a bad day. It's not your wife or your children's fault that you had a bad day. You need to take your employer to the father and let the father take care of them. And you stay in integrity and you go home and you be the father that you're supposed to be. What if fathers and mothers, pastors and church leaders, teachers and doctors had the character of Timothy? What a different world we would live in. You see that? <coughs> we would live in an entirely, you know, I was thinking today that God said years ago, he said, church is not going to be as usual. I didn't know he's going to mean this. Because <coughs> he's bringing pastors on the scene who's telling the truth. And they're not afraid to speak what the Holy Spirit's saying. And because of that, the people are changing. You're seeing more people being truly saved. You're seeing the house of God staying filled with people. And you're seeing people going out on the streets doing the works they're supposed to be doing. <coughs> Excuse me. I've lost my place. So often money or the desire for a recognized name or the desire for power has usurped a genuine concern that Paul describes Timothy as possessing. So often money or the desire for a recognized name or the desire for power has usurped the genuine concern that Paul describes Timothy as possessing. You hear, I've heard so many pastors say, I won't, I won't uh, preach to a handful of people. Uh, I'll just quit. If I can't have a hundred or more, I don't want any. That's not doing it for the right reason. Kenneth Hagin preached to the cabbage heads, Right? He didn't care how many cabbage heads was in the field. <laughs> he just went out there and preached. That's awesome. I think that's awesome. But not a one of you would, would go out and preach to a bunch of cabbage heads. What do you think you're doing in the house of God? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're trying to teach the people the ways of Jesus. And sometimes it doesn't work. You're just trying and is not getting through to them and so you don't cut your head off and throw them out you just pray for them and ask God to really open their eyes of revelation so they can see what's really going on in their lives and around about them all right may the church be those who change this and model what Timothy carried in every sphere of influence from family to government to businesses to churches may we genuinely model what it would look what it could look like when God's people become like Timothy and nurture people to have genuine concern for others, first and foremost, in whatever they do. What, and and I, I shared with Brother Christopher about a week ago, what, what, what we do in the body of Christ is we see somebody that's messed up, and we've been trying to get them unmasked for, let's say, a year, <laughs> and they're still messed up in their thinking. Instead of us praying about you know for that person we talk about what they're going through that's not right where we are opening a door for the enemy to come in and attack that person god showed me that and i called christopher and i said this is what's going on here instead of us helping that person who we think we think should know by now what to do we're saying, why aren't they getting it together? And, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. We should, we should hold them up before the Father and ask the Father to open up their eyes of understanding and let them see what's truly going on. Some people are just thick-headed. My father used to always tell me, say, you're so thick-headed. <laughs> you know, you don't learn the first time around a bush. So how many of you are thick-headed? You just didn't learn, learn the first time around. So why are we talking about somebody else that didn't learn the first time around? 
We need to be more like Timothy. We need to take into consideration that not everybody grows the same. Everybody grows differently at different levels, different understandings. And when we become like Timothy, the church is going to grow. Your family, your, in your own home, your families are going to change. You know, I have no right to judge Astrid because she's different than me. And she thinks different than me. What are you, Spanish? See, see, you know, and I, I'm not, so they, I know that each culture thinks differently. So why should I judge how she thinks when I really have no, no clue what's going on in her culture? You, are you trying, are you understand what I'm trying to say? I just receive her as a child of God. And let God do the works he has to do. Yeah, right now, since I had, had COVID, I can't hear. I think I might have to go to the, to the ear doctor and get a hearing aid because I have to have Chris listen or whoever's around me listen to what the person's saying, then they interpret it back to me, and that's embarrassing. Then I noticed tonight when I was talking to, to um, Aaron in the office, he said, what? And I think, am I not even talking? <laughs> he can't even hear me. <laughs> you know? We need to quit judging ourselves so harshly. And we need to quit judging other people, period. And we need to have the heart of Timothy. That God has sent us to minister to the people. Not change them. Because God told me only the Holy Spirit can do that. Just minister to them and let the Holy Spirit do the rest. So what if they're wronging you? I've been wronged all my life. And when I became born again, it, it, it tripled. But it's not my job to have other people like me because if you're truly following Christ, they're not going to like you. Your job is just to give the word and be an example of Jesus to them. Don't be so worried about if you're going to slip up. That's where the enemy likes to keep you in a state where you think, oh, I might slip up. You will because he'll make sure of that. You just go with the stance that I'm a child of God. I'm being led by God and and. God's not going to let me stumble and fall, and God's not going to let me sh give him a shamed face. And then just let God work through you. We all have our flaws. We all have our flaws. I'm quite sure Timothy had, his, had a few of his own, but yet he was a man of, with integrity and character, and God could use him. Okay, let's read this prayer. God, give us this genuine concern for others. Forgive us for every place that has not carried your heart and for every selfish ambition that uses others for personal gain. Transform your people in every sphere of influence to walk and live like Timothy, who had your genuine heart. Raise up a people who cause others to thrive and prosper because they were shown true and genuine love and concern as they matured in character. Raise up a people who caused others to thrive and prosper because they were shown true and genuine love and concern as he matured in character. Makes me think about um, Joyce Myers. She was a pistol. <laughs> and, you know, she was teaching Bible school, you know, Sunday school at her church. Well, the people, she became more popular than the pastor. And the people wanted to hear her instead of the pastor. And the pastor said that bothered him for a little bit, but then he he you know he went before God, he gave that to God, and he you know then Joyce went out on her own. But look how she's grown, and his church still grew. You're going to have people under you who God is going to raise up, and people are going to like them better than you. You have to let them go. You don't let let God go and take that person, and let them let God use that person the way He wants to. And you don't get jealous about it. I see a lot of jealousy in this church. It should never be. Where's your integrity? Where's your character? You ought to be thanking God that they have the gifting that they have. Amen? Well, she doesn't use me anymore. Well, maybe you need more character. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? Because the people I use, God said, you use them to do this. You saw what happened here this morning. 
you, you have this one do this, you have that one do that, because you're being trained and you're being taught to be like Jesus and God's building character in you so that you can be sent out there to do a great mighty works on your own. We're going to see Sister, Sister Catherine really grow here real quickly, and I hope that everybody stands behind her and praises and thanks, thank God that he's using her the way he's going to be using her. Let's read the scripture, Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. Jesus didn't do that. Taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Uh, church, you need to learn humility. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. One of the, one of the things that really bothered me in the house of God is people say, well, they just need to know what I'm thinking. They just have to hear the truth. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> what they need to do is to be prayed for and sent before the Father and ask the Father to let them see the truth. When I was, I'll tell you this and we'll close. When I was ordained, it was ordained over in Maryland. I forgot by what church because they disowned me after a fashion. But anyhow, it was a big church. It had a, it had a TV ministry. And I went up there, and he did. He went beat all around the bush till he finally called me up there. And when he called me up there, when he was uh, ordaining me, he really didn't want to. And I said, and I was embarrassed. And I said to myself, I said, God, if this isn't of you, you don't want me ordained, set me down. And the pastor's wife said, I want everything stopped. And she said, this woman is of the Holy Spirit. She is of God. And now we're going to ordain her the way she should be ordained. And then he went, then he changed his whole demeanor. And then he really talked like he, he, then he talked like I was a child of God. And then he ordained me. Now, see, I didn't say anything. I quietly prayed to the father and I was really embarrassed because this was going out on TV. And he was talking like I wasn't worth it. Not even a, a stick. And I really wanted to do it. Just sit down. Big, but I talked to God, and then he turned the whole thing around. And the pastor's wife said, the Holy Spirit just came into the room, and we're going to do this right. What I'm trying to tell you here is, even though you're right, and you know people are coming against you in the wrong manner, you do not have to have the last say. You just talk to your father, and you just ask the father to take control. If we would do that, we would see less confusion in the body of Christ. People have come in here, and I've told this before, but I want to refresh your memory. And they, at the end of the pastors, at the end of the service, they said, I came here to tell her she has to sit down because she's not of God. And they would cry and say, but that's not true. She is of God. She is a woman of God. And I don't know what else they said. But see, I, it was my church. I didn't tell him to sit down and be quiet. I didn't say anything. I just knew why he was here. God just told me why he was here. And I said, God, I turn this all over to you. And you do whatever is right in this house tonight. And God vindicated me. I have never once tried to vindicate myself in my walk with God. Some of you do. You need to quit. Because God's word says, I will vindicate you. At the right moment, God will vindicate you. So if you're really going to be a leader among leaders, then you have to be humble. You have to have character and integrity, and you have to have the heart of Timothy. So tonight, 
what God wants to do is he wants to anoint you with humility. And as I was sitting there doing praise and worship, I don't sing because if I sing, then my heart, heart acts up and I can't talk. So that's why I just sit there quietly. But God said, I have taught these people in this room that's here tonight everything they need to go do their own ministry if they'll just step out in faith and do it. So God has given you all the giftings. He's given you all the anointing that you need. You just have to believe it and then just go. And if you can't love your brother and sister sitting in this room, God doesn't want you. He does not want you. If, if whenever your brother or sister's down and you're kicking him, he doesn't want you. God told us this is a hospital. And I get upset when I see the congregation coming against one another because you're not a hospital. We should not be kicking each other when somebody's down. We should be lifting them up. Are you listening here tonight? I'm going to say something about Sister Grace. You know, when I first met Sister Grace, I thought, God, is she ever going to get, I'm being honest, is she ever going to get it together? And, you know, the last, I'll say eight months, this woman has more, more insight than anybody I've ever seen. She knows her father. She walks in the spirit. She hears his, her, his voice every day. And I said, God, when I first looked at her, I didn't think that she could ever be what she is today. But see, she's always been that, but she's always been put down. People have always talked about her, kicked her when she was down, and she, couldn't, she just couldn't get up. But she's learned to hold her head high, and she's learned to stay in the spirit, and she would rather help you than hinder you. She just wants to see you grow in Christ. She has the heart of Timothy. Are you listening here? You need to be honest about how you felt about people. You need to be honest about where you, how you feel about yourself. Come on. You know, Aaron and I work really close, and God told me there's going to be a separation. And I told him that. I said, I, God's saying we're separated. He said, no, there's nothing wrong, but we became separated. And I felt like I lost an arm because we weren't communicating at all. And, you know, and I just kept praying. I said, God, please don't let this be a permanent separation because God sent me him here to be mentored by me. Some people think he's been here too long. But it, I know that God isn't finished doing what he needs to do in him. And I just kept praying, God, and, and God's mended that separation today. And I just thank God that he's a God that does that. If you do the right thing, if you pray, if you seek his face, if you don't go off half-cocked to do dumb stuff, so to, if you have humility, you won't do that. So tonight, I'd like for you to come to the altar and let God give you that stronger anointing for humility where you can stand. In, I'm hearing God say in grace and under grace. You can stand no matter what the enemy is throwing your way. So the altar is open for that purpose tonight.